previously on the Adventure Zone. It's just kind of the one thing my mom took with her when when she fell out with the family, uh, uh, the, the Flame Bright Pendant. It's called the Flame Bright Pendant? You didn't think that that was germane? Where is your chosen weapon, Duck Newton? You know what? Honestly, it kind of creeped me out. So I, uh, I had a friend hold on to it. I got in a little bit of trouble in my, my not-so-shining past. <laughs> we can't let the folks of this fine town live in fear of some... Big monster is looking to do him harm. We are going to need to then set up some kind of oil and flame trap. I'll pop the top on the Lincoln and drive around until I lure him to the cave. Just watch each other's backs, play it smart, and I guarantee you, we're going to take the night. Duck, where are, you, where are you going? I'm going to take back what's mine. We're gonna we're gonna do this damn thing. We should mention that Dad, for the first time ever, is recording at his own setup at home. So if he comes in sounding like some sort of sort of shrieking demon or horrible <laughs> gargoyle, yeah, um, I do like that. After four years, we were like, you know what? We're gonna wait for the finale episode of this arc to yeah. set, to have Dad do it on his own. Yeah. I was listening to an episode of. Um, the, the first live episode of Hello from Ma- the Magic Tavern. And at the beginning of it, they had a witch come on and curse them with technical difficulties. <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought, fuck, that's good. I wish I could steal that. Wish yeah, we okay. Of that, you know. This is, if, if that is. In fiction antagonist yeah. of audio difficulties, it's amazing. If that sounds blown out, it's because there's uh, interference coming from the, the gate in in the middle of the woods oh good good there we go that's set up and let's uh we've put this off long enough let's let's get busy ned you are sitting in the driver's seat of the continental in the middle of the monongahela national forest in a small clearing just a couple hundred yards away from the arch where you encounter the beast the previous evening uh, you're parked just off the access road, a uh, quarter mile up from which is Crooked Bend Cave, where your accomplices lie in wait. Um, and you've been here for nearly an hour, just just sort of camped out, keys in the ignition, but the car and headlights turned off. Uh, you're you're sitting in your musked up Wookiee costume, which I can't imagine is terribly comfortable. How, how have you been sort of spending your time just sort of uh, hanging out here in your car in the woods in the middle of the night? Wishing I wasn't there uh, was yeah. one, uh, and saying I wish I wasn't fucking doing this. I wish I wasn't fucking doing this. I wish I wasn't fucking doing this. Uh, and listening to uh, listening to Broadway show tunes. Um, okay, I'm listening to uh, Come From Away right now. All right, I like that. I think you're in the middle of saying I wish I wasn't fucking doing I this. I wish I wasn't. Doing this. When all of a sudden, just like last night. The ambient sounds of the forest grow quieter and quieter still. The hum of crickets and frogs and owls fades out um, as if switched by a dimmer until there's no sound at all. And then immediately in front of you, you hear the sound of multiple mouths pained breathing and see the moonlight glint off of a shape 10 yards in front of you. What do you do? I say one last time, I wish I wasn't fucking doing this. And then kind of rear up in the seat so that his his head's poking up out of the top, hits the lights, lays on the horn, and says, uh, Here I am, you big goof. Come on and get my ass. I think the headlights flash on as the engine starts with a roar and... A dozen pupils narrow as the beast is illuminated right in front of you. And for a moment, it just 
stares at you, and it sniffs the air catching your scent. And for a few beats, it just stops and stands there surveying the car, almost like it's trying to make up its mind. And then it takes a step forward. And and then another deliberately, slowly at first, and then a third faster before it breaks out into a full-on charge in your direction with an echoing scream. What do you do? Well, I pull a sick driving move. I, uh, I, <laughs> I throw it into reverse and then uh, slam my foot down on the accelerator. Yeah, a, to- a Tokyo Drift. I Tokyo Drift, so I have the, the trunk is facing them and... I lay on the horn and gun the shit out of that car. It comes pretty close to your car as you uh, turn around and gun it. And just as you gun it, I think like a claw narrowly misses the trunk. Uh, The car sort of lurches as you hit the access road and get on and start driving towards the cave. And I'm singing at the top of my lungs. Born free, as free as the wind blows. Are you, um, as you're driving, are you keeping an eye on the on the beast somehow? Uh, well, the rearview mirror. Okay, I think I think you are driving now and singing into the wind and occasionally just peeking up into the rearview mirror and you, you see the beast behind you and then you look back out at the road and then you look back at the rearview mirror and you don't see the beast tailing you anymore. Uh, one minute it was there and then the next it was just gone. And you kind of turn back to, to, to look behind you to see where it is and you don't see it. And it's as you're turning back towards the, the front of the car to look at where you're driving, you, you do a double take and, and you look with horror out your passenger side window. And just behind the pine trees lining the road, you see the beast barreling at speed with your car and it's frenzied black slime is just spewing from its mouth streaming behind it as it runs and its eyes its many eyes are pulsating with bright red light and before you have a chance to do anything else it takes one last long step and jumps in the direction of your car oh shit i believe the smart thing would be to veer to the right <laughs> you jerk the wheel to the right just as you see this frenzied beast leaping in your direction and it just narrowly misses you and uh, sort of tumbles uh, behind you and rolls and then gets right back to that full gallop uh, now now a bit further behind you and as you veer to the right you're on this narrow access road and the, the your wheels skip off the side of the road a little bit and your headlights illuminate a pine tree right in front of you and your car is flying with deadly speed toward it and it's getting closer and closer. Ned, you're lying on the ground several years earlier and... How hard did he hit that tree? (laughs) And as you come to, you see a black imperial crown coupe wrapped around a tree. Um, Its engine is sputtering pathetically as smoke is pouring out from behind its crumpled hood. And in this moment in the past, you, you, you forget where you are. It's night. You remember that you just completed the biggest job of your career. And the trunk of the imperial is loaded with your haul, though you assume... Some of it was probably damaged in the crash. And in the driver's seat of this Imperial Crown Coupe is your accomplice, who you can see is is breathing but lying unconscious, splayed out on the airbag that now lies deflated on the dashboard. And you're on a, a country road somewhere, um, not too dissimilar from the one you're, you're driving on in present day, and further down this this crooked country road, you hear police sirens speeding in your direction. What did you do? Uh, I'm I'm going to try to wake up the accomplice. Uh, okay the uh, the door that uh, on the driver's side is kind of crumpled in, and you can't seem to uh, you can't you you couldn't seem to 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 get it open. the The latch mechanism is just completely busted. Um. I- I have. Well, sorry, old friend. I'm going to run back to the trunk and 
just stuff my pockets with as much of the stuff as I can. There's jewelry. There's bric-a-brac. There's some Hummel figurines, which is okay. kind of a sweet touch. I think. The Hummel figurines are probably broken. No, no. I know how no, to pack they're, stolen they're goods. They're surprisingly sturdy. Okay. And, and pack, then fill my pockets, and then I got to run into the woods. All right. That's what we see. We see Ned go to the window and try to get the door open, is unable to do so, and apologizes to his accomplice before running to the back of the car, grabbing everything he can as these sirens are getting closer and closer. And then he dashes off into the woods with one last look over his shoulder before disappearing into the night. Act under pressure. Okay. Ten. Great. Um, and I think I add one for cool, don't I? Uh, yeah, when you're driving. Yeah. Also, you get plus one, so that's a 12, I guess. Um, Super cool. You see that tree flying toward you, and you jerk the wheel to the left and get back on the road and avoid it by inches. And with the beast in hot pursuit, you tear down the road in your busted up uh, Continental. I think after your first crash into the arch a couple episodes ago, you've probably just got the one headlight uh, functioning. And, and the other one's drive- just like dangling by a couple of wires. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> as you are driving, speeding down this this access road, your, your one headlight catches Mama and Barclay hiding out in a bush in the distance right next to a sign hanging over a craggy hole in the rock face by the river, a sign for Crooked Bend Cave. Aubrey. Yes? Aubrey, you're in Crooked Bend Cave where the trap is set, the oil is spread along the floor in the cave's entrance chamber. It's a huge space that's uh, right now lit by floodlights that Duck borrowed from the ranger station. And these floodlights are are shining along the smooth tan walls of this cave, uh, bouncing off several stalactites uh, hanging from the ceiling of this area. What have you been doing as you've kind of just been waiting in this space for, for the better part of an hour? Well, I want you, you know, I don't know if everybody did this when they were a little kid playing hide and seek, but like when you bounce kind of from hiding spot to hiding spot, because you keep thinking of a better one. Yeah. Like that's what Aubrey's been doing, waiting like, oh, no, wait. And like moving <laughs> where behind you, uh, a different. Where did you land? Where are you hiding right now in this moment? I think actually right now she might be between spots, you know, like she hasn't stopped switching spots. And I think it's a, a result of nerves. And but uh, I don't think she knows that. But um, she's headed towards. She sees a rock that's kind of got its two rocks side by side, where there would be a good view between them. Okay. Of the entrance, she's headed for that. I like this. Okay, so you're you're sort of scampering from one spot to another, um, as as you've been waiting here for such a long time. And while you're doing so, the the stillness of this cave is is broken as you hear footsteps racing down the slope uh, into this main chamber. And a few seconds later, you see Ned still in the Wookiee costume, singing at the top of his lungs, running into this cave. Hi, Ned. Uh, Hello, Aubrey. How's your evening? (laughs) Going well. Ned, I imagine you take your position as, uh, as as you enter the cave. And just a few moments later... The beast makes its entrance. It slides down the slope into the cave and skids to a halt in the center of this chamber. And uh, I think it it kind of uh, hits the oil patch and sends up a big splash that kind of covers its fur a little bit. And it also kind of drifts a little as it uh, hits the ground. And um, because you were sort of out in the open as you were changing positions, you are you're both just fully exposed to each other. Now you can just tell how different the beast looks from what you saw last night. It looks furious. Its eyes are are glowing red. The animals absorbed across its pelt are all twisting and sort of beating against its body as it looks in your direction and howls. What do you do? I think Aubrey says, sorry about this. And shoot some flame. We see Aubrey, you, you you raise your hand and a spark ignites on your glove, which manifests into a small flame, which you clinch uh, in your fist and you take a deep breath and you close your eyes. 
And now we see you in that chamber earlier this afternoon. Uh, you're you're holding a, a flashlight, and you're you're surveying this this big chamber. Um, and Barclay steps into your flashlight's beam, and he he puts his hand to the ground as he kneels down, and he says, "Yeah, I th- I think this is the place." So, what did you what did you have in mind? Uh, well, I was thinking like oil on the ground, and then fire. Um, I don't want to fill this cave up with oil and then have you all get in it and then you set it on fire and you die. I want to try to like control no, it fair. with some strategic oil oil placement. So anything, any guidance you can give me for some like specific oil placement would be would be ideal. Um. Okay, here's what I want. Give me a big patch right in the middle and then a second ring around it. So kind of a target shape, so that way if we get him in the middle, we can then keep him from fleeing with a second barrier. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll make that second ring uh, (laughs) a burning ring of fire. Uh I'll make it I'll make it nice and big so you guys have some space to work. That's 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 a good plan. I think we're gonna get him in that. Thank Um, you. And then I think the two of you, I, I think he hands you a, a couple of canisters of oil that they use for the lanterns back in the lodge. Um, and the two of you take a few minutes to set up this trap. Big uh, big patch right in the middle and uh, a big ring uh, that it is sort of, uh, you have like one stream of oil connected to. So you can just sort of light the whole thing up in one go. Um, and it's quick work. You you just spread the soil out in the ground. You take a few minutes to like survey the the scene, find some good places to hide. Um, and uh, Barclay, after finishing up uh, helping you out, put the soil down. He says, "Aubrey, I gotta ask, why are you doing this? Like, d- don't get me wrong. I'm extremely grateful for the help. I've been trying to get Mama to expand the Pine Guards ranks for months. I guess she's been burned before and." She uh she hasn't had the folks that she felt like she could trust enough with our secret. But you, like, what are you doing here? Well, you know, I, I, I honestly, I don't know. It's one of those things. Uh, I'm sure you, as a Bigfoot, can relate to this. But is it just the feeling of I, I feel like I'm su- like I belong, like I'm supposed to do it. He uh he smiles and he's like. Yeah, I know that feeling. I had a lot of dark days before I knew that feeling. It makes me, it fills me with joy that you, uh, you feel that way, Aubrey. Well, I'm not one for impulse control. And so if my gut is like, yeah, then I'm like, yeah. And, and I'm, why question it? If it, if, if I feel like I'm supposed to be doing it and I can help, yeah. Agreeing to do this thing's one thing, but tonight you're gonna be you're gonna be facing down death. And I, I've been at this a little while, and so like, I my only advice. Well, it's ah, Jesus. It's it's tough, Aubrey. Because if you were anyone else, I'd advise you to just lean into the fear you're gonna feel when you you look in that thing's eyes when it's on you. Because fear's good for most folks, Aubrey. It keeps them keeps them ready. But you, I. I've known you a day, Aubrey, and I can tell you're powerful in a way that I've never really seen before. And and that power, and he, he stands up from his kneeling position and he faces you and he says, we, we got a saying back in Sylvain, wild winds don't turn the mill. That, that power you've got, if you don't keep it under control, it can be turned against you in an instant. It can be turned against the people you love in an instant. Do you know what I, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but frankly, Barkley, the same could be said about a sword or a gun or a car or anything. He says, or a Bigfoot. I, I, I look. I, I don't mean to tell your business. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to preach. I know that you can handle yourself. It's just, I am. I'm speaking from experience, Aubrey. It takes one misstep. It takes one moment. And you can find yourself using that power in a way that you will regret for the rest of your life. Roll plus weird for use magic. Uh, it is, well, it's an eight, frankly. 
Um, okay. That's good. Uh, pick a glitch for me. Okay. From your list of use magic glitches. And this is this is a very fun thing about Spell Slinger. And I, when you're picking these, I would, again, b- b- get down on my knees and beg you not to pick the thing that is going to be the most, like, help you win the game, but instead the thing that is going to be the most narratively <laughs> interesting. No, I think I'm going to have to go with the magic draws immediate unwelcome attention. Okay. Yeah, because I think the plan had been, from a hiding place, ignite the fire, and then Ned and, and Aubrey would skirt the ring and get outside the cave yeah but because of this unwanted attention that escape plan is no longer on the table i i i yeah that is taken off the table uh we see the fire erupt from your open palm in in slow motion and spread across the surface of the oil patch and we see the beast's heads turn in unison towards the heat and the light as the oil below it and covering its fur ignites, uh, setting the beast ablaze for six harm. Um, and the Whoa. ground the ground shakes as its screams reverberate through the cavern, and you see its eyes actually tear open further revealing some more of that red light and you also see holes burning in its patchwork pelt and it's revealing this this black slime carapace within um but the beast uh, like instinctively from that spot in the middle of the floor turns towards you aubrey and takes a swing and i think you have to roll um and as you do you land inside of uh, the the ring of fire, um, and now all three of you are trapped in this in this fight, sort of engaging with this beast. And duck, hey, welcome to the podcast, Justin Tyler McElroy, <laughs> special guest. Duck, from your position in the cave, uh, which where is that? From what I heard, I was in the ring of fire. Correct? Uh, yeah, you are all in the ring of fire now. Well, then it seems like that's my locale. <laughs> well, it's a, big, it's a big ring of fire. I'm imagining, were you hiding out, waiting for the trap to be sprung? What were you doing? Uh, yeah, that, that, I think that would make the most sense. Okay. I, I, I mean, I think the ring of fire is like the whole circumference of this, of this chamber. Okay, yeah. It's more to it's more to contain him. Than I would like, say towards the back then. Okay. Like towards the back away from the entrance. Uh, are you hiding behind something? Uh, Nope. Uh, you, you, I guess you're just sort of back towards the entrance and you saw the beast like run in past you, didn't really pay you any mind. And then you saw Aubrey set the fucking room on fire. Um, and you see this explosion just tear through the beast and you watch as it rears up and see its patchwork pelt tearing and burning in the flames. What do you do? I rush it with the, my weapon we see you reach over your shoulder and you grab the hilt of your weapon, this instrument of of destiny that you still don't quite understand and I think we see you from behind actually, just your silhouette as you rush towards this this beast in the pyre and you race towards it ready to strike toward the flames and Then we see you just a few hours ago uh, as the bell above the door to the Kryptonomica chimes as Ned and Duck walk into the museum while you go and take back what's yours. And at this point, you and Dad go for it and describe how this handoff happens. Well, where is it? Uh, In the chicanery. I keep only the most secret things back there, so... Mm. Yeah. Nosy Kirby doesn't get it. Come on. I follow him to the back. And we go back and come finally to a door, a quadruple locked door. Ned puts his click reader glasses on and goes through a set of keys and unlocks it and leads Duck back into the chicanery. <clears throat> so you take you take him back into the inner sanctum, as as it were. The inner Inner Sanctum. Inner Sanctum. Yeah, this is the room you talked about earlier that Kirby's not really allowed into. And no. I'm, it, uh, it ha- is Duck like the first person who's ever been in here that isn't you? Yes. Oh, okay. nobody, nobody's allowed back in the chicanery. All right. Um, it is the Innerest Sanctum. 
And there are uh, uh, now a character voice I can't get out of. Uh, there are display cases. There are all kinds of display cases and shelves. And uh, empty Coke Zero cans everywhere. And, oh, no. The new Diet Coke. Feisty oh. Cherry. Hmm. Um, Still looking for sponsors, by the way, if you're listening to Diet Coke. Yeah, Diet, Diet Coke's a big one for podcasts. If you can lock down Diet Coke for your podcast, Listen, you're set I for love life. this new feisty cherry because not only does it have that cherry flavor, but it has that little bit of kick of heat in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, all these lock display cases, one of them has an Oscar in it. <laughs> And uh, stole when you look, fucking Oscar. When, when you look at no, it, no, no, we got to dial in on this. Who did you steal an Oscar from, and what's the Oscar? It's uh, Clooney's Oscar for Sicario. <laughs> That's he won mean. an Oscar for Sicario. I know he went through so much to make the, that movie. Why I would know, you steal his fucking the, Oscar for? No, no, it? no, no, no. Well, there's a story behind it, but just to say that he thought it'd be kind of cool to steal something from Danny Ocean. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, okay. And there's other things. There's a, uh, a a briefcase with Mal Evans' name on it, but we finally end up at a case in the back. Uh, Siriana? Did you mean Siriana, by the yeah, way? Yeah, what I say? I want to keep you from getting a bunch of tweets. Siriana. You said Sicario. That's a different flick. Sicario. Oh, different, different movie. Yeah, Siriana. No tweets, please. Yeah, I think you walk by uh, all, all these cases... Um, there's a, there's a, a box that you actually got out earlier in the day in which you keep some of your, uh, some of your most prized possession. It's where you keep your, your Magnum and, uh, the, uh, the ammo for it. You, uh, you came back here and, and got strapped as it, as it were when you, uh, left your meeting with, uh, with mama in the, uh, in the lodge. And there's a few other things in there too. There's some Probably a couple passports and driver's licenses with different names, but Ned's picture on it. Um, some watches, a set of pearl earrings, a few rings, and uh, and beneath it all, I think we, the audience, just like catch a glint of it for like a second as the two of you walk by. There's a pendant on a silver chain set with a large bright red stone, um, and you walk past that as you arrive at the case with. The weapon of destiny in it. So it's the only item in the uh, it's the only item in the case, and it, it's dark. Each one of the cases has their own light switch, so that a little spotlight kind of you know highlight it, you know, like you do. And I flip the switch on, and it illuminates the weapon. Uh, I really, I'm having kind of second thoughts about at this point. Oh god, man! Once. Once I open that case, I mean, this is real. This is happening. And it's it's so annoying. Uh, an- annoying? What do you mean annoying? The sword, man. It's so annoying. Does it talk in a funny voice? I mean... Just open the fucking case before I change my mind. All right. <clears throat> Back on with the clicks. Key... Open it up. There it is. I, I want this moment of the case open and Doc, you are standing in front of it and on this cushion you see the weapon and are just kind of confronted with your past, with all of the moments that your destiny has called out to you and you have turned away from it and for the first time you're actually considering doing the opposite. What I what I see in front of me is um, a coil. It's a coil of a, a, a looks like a sword that's been coiled. Basically, there's a a hilt, uh, uh, not terribly wide, but there's a hilt there, and then the sword is kind of rolled, almost like a a whip, I guess. Um, and and we should mention this is like a a chosen thing. You built this weapon using a series of tags. Can you tell me what those are, just so I know for the for the fight? The form is handle. Right. Uh, artifact, blade, and uh, chain. Chain. Chain being like, it's... Well, you know what? It Actually, for, for what it is, it would probably be probably like... Be long. Long, long would yeah. probably be... Yeah. I like the idea of a chain sword, but that's... That I think this that's is much thing. much better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Long. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's cool. That the, all of those inform like the things that narratively this weapon can do. Okay. And I reach in, 
really slow. <laughs> and I take the handle. That's what it's called? Hilt. There's another word for Hilt? Yeah. There's a crossbar. That's what I meant to say. A cross card. So I grab the hilt. And when I do, it starts to unfurl. And I hold it up, and it unfurls into a blade. And Ned and I hear, Well, look what the cat dragged in. <laughs> hey, hey, Beacon. Oh, Christ. Well, Doc Newton. I never thought this day would come. Have you had a fun 20 years, Doc? I could sum up my... I know, man. I know that you've been... Lo I could sum up my time, if you like. Let me summarize. A man comes into the room. He lays some trash on the ground. He leaves. That happened a thousand times, <laughs> Duck. Yeah, I know. I know it's been. Who's your friend, Duck? Can Ned hear this voice? Yep. Because there's a mouth. <laughs> oh, God. I am totally blown away. You're a I ventriloquist, bet. Duck. No, I, I did not know that. This is no parlor trick. Beast. I'm surprised. <laughs> Imagine my surprise. I almost didn't recognize you without a can of soda and a magazine. <laughs> my name is Beacon. I am the light that stands at the edge of the darkness. I am the tower above the fog. I am the most beautiful, terrible weapon ever crafted. And I have spent the last 20 years in a flea market. And how are you? You're also a bit of a prick. Well, I'm a sword. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see, for 20 years, I have wasted my rapier wit. Ah. Ah. Jesus That's two Christ. in one. That's a very cutting comment, my friend. You, well, look at you attempting a turn of phrase that must have been exhausting. <laughs> Do you see what I mean now? I mean, can you? I I got about five minutes of that, and I mean, I was already really, really not sure about this, and it, he started chattering away, and I was like, okay, this is not for me. Uh, he was kind of the frosting on the cake. Not the whole reason I bailed, obviously. How does it feel, Duck, to hold this weapon? Obviously, there's a slight annoyance that comes alongside it, but the sword is not lying. This is a this is a powerful thing, and you know it is a powerful thing, and you probably haven't touched it in two decades. How does it feel to be holding it again? It's heavier than I remember, but it, there's something about it that feels right. It's like, you know what it's like? It's like when you leave your backpack somewhere, and even though you're not carrying the weight of it, as you leave, you realize that something is missing. And even though it's a weight you it, it 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 is something you have lost have misplaced and getting it back even though it's a weight feels right and i think that that is uh the closest approximation to what duck is feeling at at the moment so we're back in the present and we see duck charging and he has his hand on the hilt and as he withdraws the blade and it extends to its full length uh he strikes towards the beast roll to kick some ass hell yeah oh choice uh that is a 12 holy shit yeah i rolled an 11 i got a plus one on it that's ducks, 12 ducks rolls around point okay uh pick a uh, an extra effect i'm going to where and the monster is currently is where 
Uh, it's in the fire patch, but because of the length of your weapon, I think you're able to to stab and slash at it without getting getting in in the fire. It's in the middle, though, right? It's where we want it. Okay. Um, I'm going to inflict terrible harm. So that's one extra. So three three harm altogether. Okay. I think I ru- rush it and bury it into the monsters as close as I can get to like center mass. Yeah. And I I bury it into its gut and I hear, oh yes, this is much more like it. See, I love being put to work, duck. We could have been doing this for twenty and then he jerks it out so he doesn't have to hear the sword anymore. I, I think as you, you sort of rip the blade out of the beast, you kind of like whip it backwards. Um, I imagine you're still a little unsure of this. You've, you're have you not a sword fighter, right? But instinct kind of right. took over. And as you rip the, the blade out kind of up and back over your shoulder, uh, you, you cut a huge gash through the top of this beast as you do so, and a torrent of this black slime sprays through the air, and finally, as you sort of slice through it, its patchwork pelt just falls away. It is cast off into the fire below, and in this moment, you see the beast's true form emerging from its chrysalis. Um, it's now standing Fuck. six feet tall, six feet wide. It had a bit of padding from the uh, from the beasts it had absorbed into it. Um, it's a figure roughly lizard-like in shape, comprised entirely of that black slime material. Um, a, a tail unfurls at the back uh, of it. It extends out about three more feet, and that tail ends in a razor-sharp point just dripping with that slime. And its face is like decomposed with these thin strands of slime connecting its top and bottom jaws and its hollow eye sockets are filled with that furious red light and this creature now exposed emits a shrill howl and as that howl subsides you can hear more sounds now coming from the mouth of the cave past the fire you hear a shotgun discharge twice Uh, you hear a tree crack in half you hear a mountain lion snarling in defeat and you can tell that reinforcements are here and that Mama and Barclay are keeping them out just as they promised. And with a mighty leap, this beast hurls itself out of the flames in the center of the room and it scrambles to its feet right in front of you, Ned. Ned, what do you do? Shit my pants! All right, so that's Ned's action. I think Ned's going to use the Magnum. I don't, I, he's not a, much of a runner. No, I'm I'm going to pull the Magnum out of its uh, shoulder holster. I got it. One of those cool underarm holsters and sh- shoot the fucker in its head. <laughs> okay. Is Ned a confident user of this firearm? I, imag- I imagine this is kind of a relic of his past, not that you were going around breaking into George Clooney's house and then shooting a bunch of people on the way out. No, I don't um, think he's very competent with it at all because he wasn't a strong arm guy. He, yeah. was, he was just, he was a burglar. He was a, a sneak thief. He would steal, but he would not rob. So right. no, he's not. But with a three fifty seven Magnum, especially that close, you don't really have to be a marksman. True, to and I think you are close. So I think this would be a kick some ass and not just free damage because this thing is gonna uh, be able to get at you too. By the way, I should have uh, mentioned this. I think as you stab the sword in the beast, uh, uh, Doc, you were far enough away to stay out of the fire. Um, but as it sort of emerges from its cocoon, I think it whips around. And that tail, that that razor sharp tail, uh, slashes across you for three harm. Okay, uh, which well, would, I guess would just be one harm because you are tough. Did I? How do? Uh, real quick point of order. How does recovering harm work? Uh, you were at zero harm. Uh, the the injury. Okay, so the, the, I had two that held yeah, over, yeah. but it's like, is it like per engagement sort of? It really, it's per injury. So if you have these like minor injuries, which the 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 fight that you had with the the beast last time, uh, the the injuries you sustained were minor injuries. Those you treat overnight or whatever. Bigger hits. If uh, Ned or Aubrey take that three harm hit, they're going to need to do something about it. Um, uh, or 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 else things can get bad. A three harm hit is like a you know a. a real bad like bruised rib or something anything past four harm you need to go to the hospital um uh because you are then unstable four or more not past four four or more right 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 
Right. But like I recover the injuries. Yeah. It's all, as long as they're below three, below four. Yeah. yeah. I recover overnight or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think you just like go back and, you know, put on a band aid and you're, you're, you're more or less good to go. So, Ned, roll to kick some ass. Kick some ass. All right. It is an eight, and I have zero tough, so eight. So I pull it out of the holster, I point it at his head, and I say, You feeling lucky, punk? Fun. And I imagine you then pull the trigger? That's when you do it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you shoot this thing right in the face. Uh, what? Uh, what's the harm on your revolver? The revolver is two harm. Yeah, uh, I you you point this gun at its face and pull the trigger, and there is another spray of black slime. And I, I think all three of you are for a moment like temporarily kind of deafened as the sound of this gunshot just like explodes in this this cavern um it is indescribably loud um and the uh the beast uh rears back uh and uh sort of uh t- takes this shot head on no pun intended and as it comes back down from rearing back uh i think it hits you with uh, one of its one of its claws it has this like lizard like form but it's two front arms end in these these deadly claws uh that i think it just like jabs into you which knocks you backwards but it also hits you for two harm Ow! Um, oh, 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 ow, ow. And you are knocked away from the fire in the center of the room, and we jump to Aubrey. Aubrey, the, the fire in, in this room is now burning, I think, a lot hotter than you originally anticipated. This cavern is actually starting to get a bit sweltering, and uh, smoke is accumulating in the top of the chamber as the beast reels back from Ned. Uh, and uh, it, it kind of comes down a few feet closer to this blaze. It's nothing that is, like, posing any threat to you right now, though. What do you do? Is there any system, like, bloodied or anything in this game to know, like, we now is the time for finishing How close those? it is? Um, no, not really. Every, everything like that, and this covers a lot of stuff like this in this game, is all narrative. You, This thing, you can tell... It, you have burned away its armor. Uh, that gunshot would not have done as much damage if it still had that patchwork pelt. But because of the trap you guys laid and uh, the the stuff that you did, it now no longer has that armor. Uh, so it is it is exposed, and you you know what it's weak against, and you've dealt a shit ton of damage to it so far. Okay, um, I'm just gonna shoot fire at it again, I guess. So this is your first time using your magic as a kick some ass attack. Yeah. I want to make it clear. Spellcaster has used magic, which you can do to sort of create these different effects that you pick from a list. If you want to use your magic attack that you created when you made your character, your fire, blast, uh, all those tags you chose, it is it is a kick some ass roll, but you just do something completely different than the other, the other characters. Yes, you are correct. Okay, well, she looks this thing in the eye, and she says... 3,000 years ago, on the banks of the Nile, the Egyptian priests believed that if a person were to... It just screams, it screams at you. I am that person. That's what I was getting. Anyways, fire. And then, okay. So that's a 10. Nice. Um, well, it's 8 plus 2 for weird 10. On a 10 or above, um, the fire doesn't spread, which is super cool. And she does, like, the same, you know, snap to create the thing, fire, hands, misdirection, all that same shit that she does in her act to shoot a blast of flame at this motherfucker. Um, And so the base is blast, so it's two harm, and effect is fire, which adds two harm fire to it, so four harm. Okay, and what's your uh, your bonus effect? Because this is also a kick some ass roll, so you get something, uh, you get something special for what you rolled because this thing's going to hit you back so uh the effects are you gain the advantage take plus one forward or give plus one forward to another player you inflict terrible harm you suffer less harm uh or you force them where you want them you know i'm gonna go with uh a, a terrible harm all right a popular choice for everyone well it's, it's uh, just final battle shit you know 
Yeah, sure. Okay, that is five harm total. Uh, because you have blast, which has the tags obvious loud. I, I think it's I think it's even louder than the gunshot that just went off. I think ag- again, all of your senses are now kind of reeling. Um, I also want you to just picture when that goes off the first time. It being Aubrey's doing it like in anger and in she's just laughing hysterically after it happens. Okay. Like, did you see that? What was that? All right, it it you are cackling, laughing as this explosion goes off in the center of the room, and this thing takes five huge harm, uh, and it it takes this damage and uh, reels uh, backwards, uh, and uh, you can actually see inside of its like black carapace, you actually see like these this like faint orange light for just a second uh which kind of fades away as it comes back down to the ground and as it comes back down to the ground aubrey it doesn't slash at you with its claws i think it just like head butts you and you go flying backwards uh and as you sort of smash against the cave wall uh several feet away from where you were just standing uh you kind of bust your head uh against the wall and land down on the ground uh and take two harm for that ow uh duck uh you see your new friend aubrey uh torch torch girl as you call her get tossed backwards uh ragdolled by this thing after she uh explodes it again uh you are holding the blade in your hand and what do you do where, what's my sort of wh- which way is the beast facing which way we're, um, we're... not not towards you i think the beast is still facing toward aubrey you're standing kind of off to the side uh just a few feet away this is these this is kind of tight quarters so you you're not too super far away from this thing okay i will uh i guess i'm gonna try to tackle it yeah i think that's what i'm gonna try to do i'm gonna take a run at it from the side with beacon and try to try to n- knock it off balance uh in any particular direction to its side i'm basically just trying to get its attention uh with stabbing so what we could do here is we could do an assist roll right and instead of you traditionally trying to kick some ass if you want to try to find a way to help out the other players by hindering this monster you could do uh help out uh where you you can grant them advantages uh if you succeed which I, I think is narratively more interesting than you just continuing to slash and slash and slash at it. Yeah, uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, okay, I'm going to tackle the beast and try to uh, occupy it so I can give Ned a real clean shot at it. Okay, uh, cool. Go ahead and roll to help out. This is plus cool. Uh, seven, and then duck's cool is two. Okay, so that's a nine. Uh, it's so a, a nine. Man, that's really a, cool. Yeah, on a mixed yeah. success, your uh, help grants uh, whoever you try to help out plus one to their role, uh, but you expose yourself to trouble or danger, which is fucking fantastic. Great. Um, and so you have, is, I, I mean, to continue the uh, thread of Monster Hunter talk on this uh, program, have you mounted the monster? Explain to me like, yes, where you Yes, I have mounted the monster. I should also mention that I put on my bandit cloak before I yeah, did this sure. so, so I could carve off some, trade, yeah. some um, traded materials. What the okay. hell are you talking oh, about? Oh, we gotta get you yeah, on Monster Hunter, dead. Uh, okay. All right, Ned, you see Duck run and tackle into the monster, and it sort of uh, uh, lurches to the side a bit as... Uh, Duck collides with it, and then you see Duck is now on top of this big, slimy beast, granting you a pretty nice opening for whatever you decide to do next. And you will have plus one on whatever this roll is, as long as you are sort of using this window that Duck has opened up for you. Hey, uh, Ned, if you have any uh, options other than shooting it, I would just endorse those so fully, man. Like, you have no idea how little I want you to shoot this fucking thing. Oh, I get you, friend. No, I, this is not sarcasm. Please, Ned, for the love of Christ. You, you don't- I didn't. Hey, listen, if you want to say I didn't think through this, that's completely fair. We could totally uh, sort of debrief uh, afterwards. But please, something so, other than shooting. So you do want me to oh shoot him? Oh, God. Oh, cr- well, that's it. This is where I wrap up. Huh? All right. Well, um, them's the breaks, I guess. Ned, what do you do? Oh, God. Um, all right, so, if Ned can't shoot it because Duck told him not to, 
Um, okay, I know. The big heavy walking stick. I'm going to jam it right down this thing's throat. Just ram it right down whatever it has left of a mouth and a throat. Okay. This heavy wood walking stick. Cool. Just like a giant tongue depressor. Just ram it right down his throat. Uh, cool. Roll to kick some ass, and you will get plus one on this roll because of uh, what, what Duck set up there. Plus your, your normal tough roll. Okay, well, my tough is zero. My roll is 11. Plus one makes it 12. Jesus, these fucking rolls. Swear to okay. God. I All love right. these new die. Pick an extra effect from the list for uh, kicking some ass so very good. I think... For, um, no, I'm going to pass it forward. I'm going to pay it forward. Pay it forward to Aubrey. Uh, okay, you grant uh, Aubrey plus one forward on her next roll um, as you jam this thing down the monster's throat. Um, and as you do so, um, I think it rears its head to the side and kind of like yelps uh, as much as it can yelp with a big walking stick in its throat uh, in pain. And then when it brings its head back around, it just smashes into you. Um, and I think it probably just does one harm as you are knocked backward. And as it does that, Duck, you're also kind of tossed from its back and you land several feet away. Uh, and as you hit the cave floor, you also take one harm. Um, how many harms is, do I get? Uh, seven, but it, once you've taken four, it's serious damage. Yeah, okay. uh, and Griff, please, if a harm is below two, please don't bother me with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and now this thing is looking super not good. I know what I want to uh, do. I know what I want to do. I want to enchant a weapon and set that logging stick on fire. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, roll to use magic. Uh, well, that didn't work, but I'm going to use my luck here because I really want to do this. Okay, you're spending a point of luck. Yeah, because I think this is a top. big finishing move. I, yeah, I love it. Okay, mark, mark, uh, mark luck, and you have spent one luck. Hey, I, I want to do a cool line. Yeah, yeah, do a cool line. Fuego, you bastard. The monster lands on the floor with this walking stick in its throat, just kind of barely emerging from its mouth. And Aubrey, you're laying on the floor right in front of it, uh, and you just sit up and you grab the walking stick with your hand, and we see it glow. And as it glows uh, bright orange, I think the chamber grows silent as we watch the inside of this monster glow softly at first, and then brighter and bright orange, and then in a spray of black mist, the beast explodes. And as it explodes, I think all three of you are flung backwards uh, away from the beast as this wave of force shoots out at you. And Aubrey, because you were right up against the wall, I think you smash up against the wall again and you, you bang your head again. And as you land on the floor and you roll a couple feet as you bounce off of it, um, the the scene around you just kind of starts coming to you in flashes. You see Duck and Ned um, struggle to climb to a kneeling position. You see the smoke uh, that was filling this chamber uh, is 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 spreading much faster now. This fire is has grown wild, uh, and the smoke is filling your lungs, and now you're kind of unable to catch your breath. And in another flash, you look toward the mouth of the cave, and you see that wall of fire still roaring high. And as your vision finally fades, you see a figure appear in the fire. You see a large woman wrapped in her duster leaping through the flames in your direction, and then you lose consciousness. Hey everybody, this is Griffin McRoy, your temporary dungeon master, your best friend, and your old 
old sailor coming into the docks got a bunch of fish that i'm here to sell to the townsfolks and uh thank you so much for listening to the adventure zone this is the final episode in our amnesty mini arc uh we've had so much fun doing this one and i feel like we all really learned a lot about what we want to do for uh, the next full season of the podcast so we hope you enjoyed it and uh we are going to be moving on to travis's game next a uh, a mini arc that he's calling dust uh, and we are going to be playing a new game uh, called Urban Shadows, if you want to go ahead and start reading up on that, and you'll find out a lot more when we do our setup episode uh, for the Adventure Zone Dust, DM'd by Travis McRoy, starting next week. But for right now, let's talk about some advertisers. Uh, first off, I want to tell you all about Casper. Support for the Adventure Zone comes in part from Casper this week, who's offering a competitive, limited-time President's Day offer for the first time ever. Casper has three mattress lines to choose from, the original Casper, the OG, the innovative Wave, and the streamlined Essential. Ooh, Essential. Gotta get that Essential sleep for your most essential bones. Casper isn't just a mattress company. They also uh, have sheets and pillows and bed frames and even dog beds for your essential dogs. Uh, we have a Casper mattress here in our house, uh, in our, our guest room that I've, I've slept on a, a couple times, uh, mostly as long as I'm talking about when I do get very bad gas or some sort of stomach issue. And I don't, I don't want to be in the, you know, my regular bed with, uh, with Rachel, just blasting up a storm. I'll sleep on that Casper, and it's nice and soft. Also, my guests sleep in it, and it's very comfortable for them. And they tell me how comfortable it is. Although I think they'd be less comfortable knowing that um, I go in there to have tummy sickness. I don't think this is a good advertisement anyway for a limited time visit casper.com slash savings and receive up to two hundred dollars for your purchase of two thousand dollars or more this special offer expires february 20th 2018 see casper.com slash terms for more details the adventure zone is also uh, supported in part by blue apron blue apron partners with sustainable farms fisheries and ranchers to bring you all the ingredients you need to create incredible home-cooked meals ingredients come paired with an easy to follow recipe card and they're delivered directly to your door weekly in a refrigerated box uh we love blue apron uh i've used it for a long time and learned a bunch of very valuable cooking skills and made a bunch of really tasty dinners for for me and the family and uh, I'm, I'm a big fan you can rediscover how fun cooking can be while enjoying specialty ingredients and exploring new flavors and cuisines get 30 dollars off your first order by visiting blueapron.com slash adventure Got a few Jumbotrons uh, to tell you about. Before we get into those, I have a quick correction for a Jumbotron. I really goofed up a couple weeks back. Uh, it was all about the Legion of Renab, which uh, is a, uh, a a actual play podcast that sounded like a lot of fun, and I did call it Legend of Renab. Many times, apparently. That's not what it's called. It's Legion of Renab. Uh, and a few of our listeners pointed out that Renab is uh, the word boner spelled backwards. So take that that information internalize it let it allow you to grow as a person and then go check out legion of renob uh, you can find out more and listen to the whole podcast uh at legion of renob and that's legion of and then the word boner spelled backwards dot com our first Jumbotron this week is all about D20 dames. Do blood-soaked dungeons and ale-infused hijinks pique your interest? Then roll initiative with D20 dames, a storytelling podcast powered by D&D and conjured into existence entirely by witches. Er, women. I don't know why I read er that way. Er, women. Uh, every other week, these daring ladies explore a fantasy world with epic shenanigans along the way, like beheading or befriending monsters and punching a whole lot of creeps. Uh, jump into the story now at D20 Dames. That's D and then the number 20, dames.com, or subscribe on iTunes. Seriously, go find it now. Misadventure awaits. Go listen to D20 Dames. Go scratch that actual play itch. It's uh, it's it's good for what ails you. We all need more adventure in our lives. What are you going to do? Go fucking hang gliding? Nah. 
I also want to tell you all about Join the Party. Join the Party is a character-driven 5th edition actual play. Actually, they say real play. Is that what we're calling it now? Anyway, a real play podcast that sounds like an audio drama. Uh, They got fights, but also robots, political intrigue, queer characters, skater teens, and transcripts for every episode. When three unlikely heroes are plucked from jail to defend the wedding of the millennium, they're sucked into an adventure of talking gargoyles, anarchist bandits, and the royal betrayal. Something old, something new, something borrowed, and something that might just kill you on Join the Party. You can uh, check it out by subscribing to Join the Party wherever you listen to podcasts or find them on Join the Party Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumbo or Tumblr. But the teens are calling it Tumbo. I want to thank everybody who's been tweeting about the show using the the Zonecast hashtag. Um, I I really appreciate folks spreading the word about uh, the whole show and about Amnesty. Uh, You all have been really very kind to us in in telling all your friends who you think might be into this sort of supernatural drama thing that we that we made here with this mini arc. And we hope that you will continue supporting the mini arcs um, as we get a little bit closer to season two. Um, And if you do that, you might end up as a character in the show at some point. I'm kind of done naming new characters for amnesty i don't know what travis's plan for for dust is but i'm i'm sure we'll find out in the coming weeks um but yeah if you could spread the word we we really do appreciate it um a a whole lot and thank you very much in advance uh i also want to thank maximum fun you can go to maximumfun.org and check out all the great podcasts there all for free and i guarantee you're gonna find something that you're just gonna really fall in love with shows like stop podcasting yourself and judge john hodgman and lady to lady and switchblade sisters and tights and fights and and so many others, all at MaximumFun.org. And uh, if you want to hear and see the video stuff that uh, we all do, you can go to McElroyShows.com. Uh, also, we are making a graphic novel adaptation of the first arc of the Adventure Zone Balance called Here There Be Gerblins. And you can find out more about that and snag a pre-order at TheAdventureZoneComic.com. I'm going to let you get back to a kind of the come down of this episode. Uh, and again, thank you all so much for uh, all the support that you've shown for, for Taz Amnesty. It, it, it means a lot. And um, we'll be back next week with the setup episode for the Adventure Zone Dust. So uh, I'll talk to you then. Bye. Aubrey, the next day comes to you in waves you find consciousness in these brief flashes again Uh, a nurse comes in to check your charts Um, ned and duck swing by for a visit Uh, a different nurse changes your iv and in one of these flashes of consciousness there's mama and she's in the hospital bed right next to yours and her hair is a bit singed and she's wearing an oxygen mask but she's otherwise no worse for wear and she's holding your hand and she's smiling behind her mask and then in another flash it's morning and mama's bed is empty and barclay's sitting in the corner and he's he's reading a lamplighter and as you start to stir as you finally wake up you see him peek over the paper and he looks a bit startled and he says welcome back Where's mama? Oh, she's 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 fine. She um she ran off last night, asked me to come in and stand vigil. And Dr. Harris Bonkers. How's Dr. Harris Bonkers? Dr. Harris Bonkers is back at the lodge. Danny's watching. Okay. Mama said she had to run an errand. She um she actually left you something. And he, he reaches into uh, a jacket. He's wearing a big pea coat. Uh and he pulls out uh a piece of paper. You can actually tell that it's a medical chart. Uh, that has been like folded up and uh, written on your name is written on the uh, the outside of this letter and he hands it over to you and uh, he says um, I'll go uh, I'll go tell the nurse that you're up any luck give uh, me some jello can... yeah I'll make sure to score you some jello don't worry about lime. that I've make had... sure it's lime please this is important he laughs he says I, I-, I talked to him they said any luck I can take you back to the, the lodge tonight to recuperate Aubrey you did unbelievably well last night. Then get me two jellos. <laughs> he yeah. laughs and he walks out of the room. And you open Mama's letter. And it reads You and I don't know each other very well yet, Aubrey Little. So you'll have to take my word for it that 
I'm not the kind of person who finds themselves satisfied or impressed by the exploits of other folks very easily. I'm, I'm quick to shut folks out, and I, and I know that. This life I live requires it. But, Aubrey, I am proud beyond belief to know you. You did something last night that few folks can do, and I'm not talking about shooting fireballs out of your hands or slaying a monster the size of a Volvo either. I'm talking about the moment that you decided to step foot into that cave. You did something hard last night, something scary and necessary, and you did it without hesitating, not for a second. And that courage, Aubrey, I'd, I'd say you remind me of myself when I was younger if I didn't think it made me sound like a self-flattering old fart, but yeah, you know. Life is tough for everyone who lives it, not just this glamorous life of monster hunting, Aubrey, all of it, everyone's. Most folks just stumble through it feeling lost and directionless, no no sense of purpose. I know that feeling all too well before I started doing this work, before the lodge. We don't know each other very well, Aubrey, but I know a calling when I see one. You belong here at the lodge. You belong in the Pine Guard, protecting this world alongside me and Barclay. And Ned and Duck, too. I'm pretty sure those two wouldn't last a second in these woods without you. I'm hoping this letter finds you in the same enthusiastic mood I saw when I first met you, Aubrey, because I got kind of a big ask. Stay here. Help us fight back against the dark. You keep at it. I promise I will help you find out where your powers come from just as soon as I get back. Oh, right. I gotta leave. Just for... just for a bit. Barclay will get you set up while I'm gone. I got some unfinished business needs taken care of, and that's all I can say about that right now. I'll I'll catch up next time I see you. I'm reading this letter back right now, and I realize it's all sounding a bit melodramatic, so you'll have to forgive me for that. I don't want to scare you away with a bunch of talk about saving the world. See, in my experience, that's a bit too intangible a goal for someone to fight for anyway. That's the advice I'm going to leave you with, Aubrey. When you're out there toe-to-toe with some demon and you find yourself asking what you're doing it all for, Just do what I do. I don't think about the world, Aubrey. I think about Amnesty Lodge. I think about it on a nice day. Danny's out in the garden outside and it's in full bloom. There's a breeze off the river pouring in through the windows, carrying the song that Moira's playing at the piano through the whole building. Jake and Barclay are back in the springs and Jake's howling about the X Games or some shit. And all these folks, folks who thought their lives were finished once, they're together. They're happy. They're safe. I don't know about you, Aubrey, but to me, that sounds like a place worth fighting for. And as you lower the letter, you see your jacket slung over the chair in the corner of your hospital room, and it's a bit roughed up after your your eventful evening, but it's held together. And through the arms of the chair, you can see inside the lapel, and you see, sewn into the fabric, the pine guard patch. Duck, you're home the night after the hunt. How are you? Uh, how are you doing? Pretty shaken up, I think. Um, I, I think that Duck maybe doesn't. Uh, I'm not gonna say wasn't in control, but he was more capable than he sort of thought he would be, and I, I think it's it's left him a little unnerved. Uh, my next question is very important for me to know because I'm very excited to hear the answer. Where do you even put a talking sword in your apartment? Where do I put the talking sword in my apartment? Uh, well. Do you stuff it in a box in the closet despite its protests, or do you sort of give no, it a nice little habitat? It, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I put it up with the, uh, with the, the coffee mugs. It's kind of, ha- it's kind of stuffed up there above the coffee mugs. Okay, in a cla- a cabinet you can shut. I yeah, but I leave it open because I feel like I I probably owe it. I owe Beacon that at least. Yeah, I think Beacon's very grateful when you you put him up there and and give him a little sunlight. Um, oh no, he's still being really shitty about oh, okay. it. Okay, <laughs> but Great. he does appreciate that at least. I can tell. Uh, I think we see you there uh, in the in the kitchen, uh, just doing some doing some chores. Uh, the the night after the hunt and. You walk out back into the living room, and 
in a flash, there's Minerva. It's still a blue glowing silhouette standing in your living room. Um, and she's got her back turned to you as you enter, but she quickly reorients herself and faces you. And she takes a beat and she says, Duck Newton. Oh, God. You're different. You've embraced your destiny, haven't you? Yeah, I, gu- I guess. She gives this big, hearty laugh. And she says, Are you still afraid, Duck Newton? You know, I think I'm more afraid. More afraid? Even with the weapon of destiny clutched in your hand? Yeah, I mean, in the moment, it's kind of more of an annoyance. But now that it's sort of, I feel like I, I opened a door that I don't know how to shut. And for a long time, having a closed door was was enough but i don't know how to walk this back and i i'm not crazy about that feeling she looks contemplative for maybe the first time that you've ever seen from minerva and she says i can understand that but be not afraid duck newton you possess a weapon far greater than those wielded by your foes you have me in your corner and and what does that get me exactly? A friendship you will learn to treasure, Duck Newton. <laughs> she she gives a big bellowing laugh again, and she says, Duck Newton, your destiny is larger than you could possibly comprehend, my friend. With your bravery and my expert tutelage, you will find the strength you require to save... And just like that, Minerva disappears. And... Somewhere far, far away, we see Minerva. We actually see her, not just her shadow. She's about six feet tall, uh, head shaved and decorated with paint in an intricate pattern down to her forehead. She's wearing a blue tunic over some bulky armor. um, And she's standing on this glowing circle in a dark chamber. And she's speaking to a silhouette in the rough shape of Duck Newton. And in a flash, Duck's shadow disappears as Minerva was mid-sentence. And now she's alone in this place as the circle below her grows dim. And she closes her eyes and she sighs and she stays like that, almost meditative for several seconds. And then she opens her eyes and smiles at the progress her counterpart has made. And with several large strides, she walks toward the wall of this chamber and she slides open a window. And we see her there smiling as the faint orange light from outside beams down on her face as she's filled for the first time in a long time with hope. Ned, you have returned after taking a well-earned day off from the Cryptonomica. You you arrive with a chime from the bell above the door, and we, we see your museum, and it's as clean as the day you bought it. You see Kirby uh, walking around with a, with a rag, just sort of finishing up, getting everything uh, polished up right before you open, open the store up to the general public. And he sees you enter, and he says, uh, Hey, boss, you, you feeling better? I feel pretty good. Uh, you know, thankfully, the uh, my uh, Chewbacca suit took a, a brunt of the blow, but I'm I'm feeling good, feeling fine, like cherry wine. He says, "You told me yesterday you were taking a sick day. Why were you wearing your Chewbacca suit?" Uh, you know what? I I kind of gotten to the point where I like it. <laughs> I, I just uh, you know, it's it's uh, tapered. You know, it's not like your standard Chewbacca suit. I, I, it, it, you know, it's like one of those, uh, one of those form-fitting ones, and I think it kind of accents my. I have some pretty big shoulders, so uh, he chuckles and he says, um, "Well, uh, I, I kept the shop up and running yesterday. Got the the place cleaned up, looking. Uh, sorry, museum. Got the museum up and looking good. 
did a bit of deep cleaning. Uh, you should really consider dusting this place a little more often than you do, which is, I'm assuming, literally N- never. 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 Um, it and- adds to the ambiance, the dust, the cobwebs. Come on. Do you know nothing of showmanship? Uh, and the two of you are having a bit of uh, debate about cleanliness as the bell above the door rings again. And a young woman enters the room. Uh, she's got a camera strapped around her neck, and she's got a hiking pack. And she says, uh, is, this the, uh, is this the Cryptonomica? Welcome to the Stygian darkness that is the Cryptonomica. As you enter, you will be faced with mind-boggling sights, things that threaten your very sanity. Welcome, welcome. I, I think you're giving this spiel as a second person walks in, an uh, older man also carrying a hiking pack, and he walks in, and I think he just starts looking around at the exhibits, And you have never seen, I think, two customers in this store at the same time. And Kirby smiles and he says, uh, I think, uh, I think our financial troubles are behind us. And he kind of waves you to, to come over to his desk. And you approach and he opens up his computer and you see the computer is open to, uh, his webpage, thelamplighter.org. And he gives the page a quick refresh, and I think you're both startled by the number that you see on the screen. 186,000 views. Kirby was impressed with the footage that you shot with his camera. You in your Bigfoot costume fighting a bobcat? But still, he never expected it to actually go viral. And now you see the description to this footage. For the full video, visit the Cryptonomica. 43 Bedlam Lane. Kepler, West Virginia. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported. I'm Allegra Ringo. And I'm Renee Colbert. And we host a podcast called Can I Pet Your Dog? Renee, can I tell you about a dog I met this week? Uh, I wish that you would. In turn, though, can I tell you about a dog hero? May I tell you about a dog breed in a segment I like to call Mutt Minute? (laughs) I would love that. Could we maybe talk about some dog tech? Could we have some cool guests on, like Lin-Manuel Miranda, Nicole Byer, and Ann Wheaton? I mean... Yeah, absolutely. I'm in. You're on board. What do you say we uh, we do all of this and put it into a podcast? Yeah, okay. You think? <laughs> all right. Uh, should we call it like I don't know? Can I pet your dog? Sure. All right. Uh, what do you What do you say we put it on every Tuesday on Maximum Fun or on iTunes? Sounds, Sounds good to me. <laughs> Meeting's over. Yeah, Mark. Hey, buddy. Oh, hey, what's up, ma'am? Um, so I'm at this mafia restaurant. What? I'm going to go in and ask these guys what they think the best pasta shape is. Mark, they're probably eating it. I have a hunch that it's probably ravioli, but I mean, you know what? That's a good idea. Whatever they're eating, I'll just take a look in their bowls Why don't and you see what they have. Maybe There's supposed to be a big meeting there today. Can you see it from the street? That sounds really dangerous. So I'm just going to go inside and ask. Don't don't bother them. They're probably eating, you know. Well, look, I'm not threatened by them. How about we tell them what the best pasta is on our podcast? We got this with Mark and Hal. Oh, that's a great idea. Thank God. Tuesdays at 9? On MaximumFun.org.